Recently, the BRICS countries met in South Africa for their annual summit. Some expected them to unveil a new reserve currency backed by commodities, primarily gold. Fortunately or unfortunately, this didn't happen. However, the BRICS did unveil something arguably much bigger when they invited six very important countries to join the coalition. This is in addition to the dozen other countries that have applied to join the BRICS. So today, we're going to tell you everything you need to know about the BRICS alliance, including how it came to be, why it's more powerful than people think, and how it could challenge the US dollar with crypto in the next decade. Let's start with a bit of background. BRICS is an acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The term was coined in 2001 by Jim O'Neill, the former chairman of Goldman Sachs's Asset Management Division. Back then, the acronym was BRIC. South Africa wasn't part of the original lineup. Naturally, Jim was interested in the BRIC countries because he believed that they would be the fastest growing economies of the coming decades and become the largest economies by 2050. Jim believed this would be due to their low labor costs, rapidly growing populations, and abundance of natural resources. Today, this prediction seems crazy to many, but back then it made perfect sense to most. For context, many of these countries had started joining US-affiliated organizations at the time, notably China joining the World Trade Organization. The commodity markets were also booming. Remember that for later. Now, in a 2012 interview, Jim revealed that the performance of the BRICS countries had exceeded his expectations. By then, it was the BRICS because South Africa had joined in 2010. Jim had predicted that the BRICS would account for 14% of global GDP by 2010. They ended up accounting for over 18%. By that point, Goldman Sachs had introduced a BRICS investment fund which had accumulated almost $1 billion in assets under management, which was a lot back in those days. In all seriousness, all of Wall Street was insanely bullish on the BRICS, but this sentiment had turned bearish by 2014. Now, this shift in sentiment seems to have been due to two factors. The first was that Xi Jinping became the president of China in 2013. Xi immediately began embarking on various initiatives that were more in the interests of China and less in the interests of the United States, such as the Belt and Road Initiative. If you watched our video about the man who predicted everything, you'll know that the Belt and Road Initiative marked the end of the so-called Age of Debt, wherein the West had benefited from Eastern countries purchasing its debt. Instead of buying Western debt, China started building global infrastructure. It's possible, if not likely, that Wall Street giants like Goldman Sachs were put under pressure by the US government to stop investing as heavily in the BRICS because of China going rogue. Now, the other factor that caused Wall Street's sentiment on the BRICS to flip was that commodity prices collapsed in 2014, primarily oil. This was caused by an oversupply of oil coming from the United States. US oil producers had discovered new reserves in Texas a few years earlier. If you watched our recent video about Nigeria, you'll know that the country's economy got absolutely decimated by the subsequent decline in oil prices. The same was true for other commodity-reliant economies in the global south. By 2015, the BRICS narrative was all but dead, and all the BRICS-related funds on Wall Street had closed or consolidated. In a recent interview about the most recent BRICS conference, Jim revealed that China was the only BRICS country that had continued to grow according to his expectations. Jim said that the growth in the other BRICS countries was disappointing and said the same about BRICS's evolution as an organization. In retrospect, he said it made no sense that South Africa was added and that it made no sense that all the countries under consideration by the BRICS also had weak economies. But that is just the US side of the story. The BRICS side of the story sounds very different, and what it suggests about the BRICS economies and their evolution is a lot more nuanced. For starters, the BRICS technically isn't an official organization. It doesn't even have an official website or social media. 
the current website for the BRICS seems to be run by Russians, and that's not a coincidence. Russia was the one which turned the acronym into an actual thing, driven by President Vladimir Putin. At a UN meeting in 2006, the foreign ministers of the BRICS countries gathered for their first informal meeting. However, it wasn't until 2009 that the BRICS countries held their first formal meeting in Russia. This is interesting because it's possible, if not likely, that the 2008 financial crisis was the catalyst that brought the BRICS together. For reference, it's believed that 2008 shook global confidence in the US-led system. Now, 2012 is when things started to get truly interesting for the BRICS. The countries collectively pledged to give $75 billion to the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, in exchange for reforms. If you've watched any of our videos about the IMF, you'll know that it's an international organization closely affiliated with the US that gives US dollar loans to developing countries. You'll also know that these loans come with conditions that are often unfavorable, hence the BRICS wanting reforms. Not surprisingly, the BRICS didn't get these reforms. The result was India proposing that the BRICS set up its own versions of the IMF and the World Bank, another international organization closely affiliated with the US that issues US dollar loans to developing countries for infrastructure development. So, in 2014, BRICS countries created the BRICS Contingent Reserve Arrangement, or CRA, and the New Development Bank, which is colloquially referred to as the BRICS Development Bank. Whereas the CRA is just a framework, the BRICS Development Bank is an official organization headquartered in China. BRICS countries have an almost equal stake in both. Now, the framework includes a capital contribution of 100 billion US dollars, which is primarily meant for a payment emergency in a member country. Based on our understanding, the bank can issue up to 100 billion dollars of loans for infrastructure development. And if you're wondering why this is so significant, that's because the IMF and the World Bank were the international organizations that set the stage for the US-led world order. Both were created at the famous Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, where the US dollar was established as the world's reserve currency. In the decades that followed, other international organizations closely affiliated with the US were established, such as the UN, and many countries were corralled into these organizations by the IMF and the World Bank. This was done using those aforementioned conditions on loans, which favor US policy. Now, obviously, the BRICS aren't in the same position that the US was in the 1940s. Nobody believes that the Chinese yuan, the Russian ruble, the Indian rupee, nor a basket of these currencies is going to become the world's reserve currency. You can watch our video about the BRICS currency to find out why. Link in the description. Now, that said, it's clear that the BRICS wants to compete with other US-affiliated international organizations like the UN, and it's clear that the CRA and the BRICS Development Bank are precursors to this. But if the BRICS truly want to compete, first they must become an official organization. This ties in to the BRICS' most recent summit in South Africa. The most important part of the summit seems to have been missed, and that's the fact that Xi was physically in attendance. As pointed out by macroanalyst Western Nakamura, Xi has only left the Chinese mainland once since January 2020. Not only that, but Xi was physically in attendance at a time when the Chinese economy is reportedly on the brink of collapse. This suggests that the BRICS is even more important than China to Xi. Alternatively, it could mean that most of what's being said in the media is FUD or fake news, which is also possible. Regardless, Xi's presence was very important, and it begs the question of why he made the effort. From our perspective, the answer seems to be that Xi wanted to show the world that the BRICS is a serious thing, notably to the countries that the BRICS invited to join their coalition, the other important news. Now, in case you missed that news, the BRICS invited Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Iran, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Argentina to join the coalition. If they accept the invitation, all six countries will become a part of the BRICS starting January 2024. 
It's not clear if the acronym will change again at that point. The Cubiaceas, the Abicurices, the Eubia Crisis. It's not easy with all those new vowels. Leave your suggestions in the comments. Now, in any case, these new countries are significant for many reasons, the main one being they are all major oil or agriculture producers. In case you're wondering, Saudi, the UAE, Iran and Egypt are the major oil producers, while Ethiopia and Argentina are the major agricultural nations. As a fun fact, Argentina is the most self-sufficient country in the world. It's estimated that it could feed its entire population with just a fraction of its resources. It's a damn shame that hyperinflation is ruining everything. They also aren't being helped by the IMF, which recently forced the Argentine government to curb crypto adoption. Anyway, commodities aside, there are other reasons why these countries are significant. In Saudi Arabia's case, it's significant because of its role in supporting the so-called petrodollar system. For those unfamiliar, the petrodollar system ensures that all oil is bought and sold using US dollars. In case it wasn't clear enough, Saudi has been trying to de-dollarize. This is evident in its experimentation with accepting payment for oil in other currencies, namely Chinese yuan. Oddly enough, every country that's tried to move away from the US dollar has found itself in conflict. On that note, Iran is significant because it's been heavily sanctioned by the United States due to its alleged involvement in terrorist activity. Iran's admission to the BRICS could therefore cause geopolitical issues for its other member countries and potentially be a turnoff to the other prospective applicants. Speaking of which, it appears that the main reason why the BRICS hasn't become an official organization yet is precisely because its members are concerned about pushback from the US. India is the outlier in this regard. It's been the most hesitant to side with the other BRICS on issues like a new currency. And yet, a dozen other countries have formally applied to join the BRICS over the last year or so. This list includes Algeria, Bangladesh, Belarus, Bolivia, Cuba, Honduras, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Palestine, Senegal, Thailand, Venezuela, and Vietnam. Over a dozen other countries have expressed interest in joining too. This might have something to do with the fact that the BRICS is already bigger than many people think. Quote, the five existing BRICS countries account for almost 31.5% of global GDP, compared to 30.7% for the G7. Furthermore, with 3.14 billion people, BRICS nations account for 41% of the world's population. It's believed that BRICS will establish a formal organization once it becomes large enough, and the recent and future additions could do the trick in that regard. If just the six invited countries join the BRICS, then the bloc will account for almost 40% of world GDP. And if the applications from the other countries are approved, then it will account for more than 50% of the world's population. It could also account for most of the world's commodity exports by that point. This relates to the only missing ingredient in BRICS's rise, and that's commodity prices. You'll recall that one of the main reasons why Jim was bullish on the BRICS was because of their abundant resources and high commodity prices. You'll also recall that the BRICS narrative fell apart when commodities crashed. But the other reasons why Jim was bullish on the BRICS haven't really changed. The cost of labour in these countries is still very cheap, and most of their populations continue to grow. When you realise this, the addition of South Africa and the other countries makes sense. All that's missing is commodity prices. Well, as it so happens, commodity prices follow a cycle which repeats every 20 to 30 years. As you can see, prices of oil, agriculture, livestock and base metals are highly correlated, though they peak and trough at slightly different times. Even so, they seem to follow a trend of 10 to 15 years up and 10 to 15 years down. The last commodity cycle peaked in the early 2010s. This means the next peak could happen as soon as the mid-2030s. However, commodity prices could continue to fall until the mid-2020s. 
The caveat is that commodity prices are likely to vary by type and by region, with some rising first and others rising later. Anyway, technicalities aside, the BRICS narrative will likely flip back to bullish during the next commodity cycle, and not just because they have lots of natural resources. As you can see, the profits for extracting resources and turning them into commodities are much higher in current and future BRICS countries. This is due to many factors such as developed countries having exhausted the most accessible resources, developed countries having higher labour costs and fewer people, and developed countries having more regulations. The BRICS countries are at the opposite end of the spectrum for all these factors. If the BRICS coalition manages to add all the major commodity exporters, it could establish monopolies on the most valuable commodities and force countries to side with the BRICS in exchange for these commodities the same way that the US has forced countries to side with it in exchange for US dollars. Now, to be clear, the US and some of its allies have lots of natural resources too. Again, the difference is that the US and select allies have less accessible resources, higher costs of labour and more regulations. Investors will see this dynamic and probably take their money to the BRICS for bigger profit margins. At the same time, US allies who are unable to secure most of their own resources, such as Europe, will face extreme pressure to buy less expensive commodities from the BRICS. The inevitable result of this is that the BRICS will have a de facto monopoly on commodities outside of everywhere but North America. This pertains to an important question that countries around the world will have to ask themselves when the next commodity cycle inevitably comes around. Which do I value more? The US dollars used to buy commodities or the commodities themselves? Again, the answer will ultimately depend on geography. Countries which produce most of their commodities will likely be the first to ditch the US dollar. Lo and behold, most of the BRICS countries produce most of their own commodities and have been actively trying to ditch the US dollar in recent years. This is not a coincidence from a commodity point of view. Conversely, countries who import most of their commodities will likely continue to value US dollars more so long as it's commercially viable to do so. The inflation of the US dollar, high commodity prices from US allies, and geopolitical tensions with the BRICS will likely force them to side with the BRICS in the end. As far as we can tell, the EU will be the first to fold. Large European countries such as France have already been hesitant to side with the US when it comes to China. Chances are that an EU country could break ranks and join the BRICS in the coming years. This is likely when the bloc will be taken seriously again. All of which brings me to the big question, and that's where crypto could fit into this picture. Well, as the US dollar continues to decline, an alternative currency will rise. It's evident that the BRICS want a common currency they can use for commodity payments in lieu of the USD. As I mentioned earlier, it's very unlikely that any one of the BRICS currencies could play this role, and even less likely that a basket of BRICS currencies could play this role either. That's simply because there will be constant disagreement about the composition and governance of these currencies. Case in point, BRICS countries apparently couldn't agree on the details of the CRA and the BRICS Development Bank when they were first proposed. Never mind that many of the BRICS countries also have significant geopolitical tensions between them, such as China and India, over disputed territory. The idea that BRICS countries could trust each other's currencies on a large scale is quite frankly laughable, and it will be downright hilarious when they start rolling out central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. That's because it'll become that much easier to control the transactions of others. As we've mentioned in many videos, what the BRICS countries require is a credibly neutral currency, preferably one that's digital so that it's easy to store and transfer across borders. Now, as amazing as it would be to have a gold-backed currency of some kind, it would not be very user-friendly, to say the least. Now, believe it or not, but the ideal BRICS currency would be Bitcoin's BTC. That's because BTC is created by proof-of-work mining, which requires lots of commodities for computers, and the Bitcoin blockchain is secured by the energy commodities that computers use. 
Newsflash: BRICS countries have most of both. This makes BTC a credibly neutral currency that the BRICS can collectively control, albeit to a much lesser extent than a fiat currency. To make any sort of change, BRICS countries would have to account for most of Bitcoin's mining power and collectively agree on changes with Bitcoin developers and the community. By contrast, if the BRICS adopted a proof-of-stake cryptocurrency, then the US could easily print the dollars it requires to buy up the stake it needs to maintain control of the blockchain. So long as the US dollar retains its supremacy, it could undermine any proof-of-stake crypto adopted by the BRICS. Some would argue that proof-of-stake cryptos are fundamentally a derivative of the US dollar for this reason, but that's a topic for another time. Now, if you think all this is just baseless crypto bro speculation, think again. The BRICS have actually been discussing using crypto for payments since at least 2017. In 2019, BRICS countries discussed creating a unified crypto payment system, with Russia proposing a unified stablecoin less than a year later. What's fascinating is that this push for the BRICS to adopt crypto seems to be coming primarily from Russia. This could be because of Russia's outsized development of crypto-related technology. Whatever the reason, it seems that Russia is more open to adopting crypto than ever. There have been multiple reports about Russia considering using crypto for international trade and even mining its own BTC for these purposes. One Russian bank is apparently using crypto for international trade already. Of course, Russia's recent willingness to adopt crypto is doubtless due to the unprecedented sanctions imposed on it by the US and its allies after invading Ukraine last year. This is a position that Iran is familiar with, and probably why Iran is also reportedly using crypto for international trade as of last autumn. Come to think of it, Iran joining the BRICS in 2024 could be one of the catalysts that opens the door to BTC adoption within the bloc. The fact that central banks around the world will be allowed to hold up to 2% of their balance sheets in crypto starting 2025 sets the stage for non-BRICS countries to follow suit. And then Bitcoin will be just a few steps away from becoming the world's next reserve currency. And you can learn more about that using the link in the description. Anyway, that's all for today's video, folks. If you learned something new, smash that like button to let me know. If you want to keep learning new things, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. If you want to help others learn something new, take a second to share this video with them. If you're already accumulating the world's next reserve currency, make sure you're doing so using a trustworthy exchange and storing your sats on a secure hardware wallet. And if you don't know where to find these, well, the Coin Bureau deals page is the only place you need to go. It's got up to $40,000 in discounts and airdrops on the best crypto exchanges, along with the biggest trading fee discounts in the industry. We've also got some of the best deals on the best hardware wallets too. The link, of course, will be down in the description. So, as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. This is Guy, over and out.